Hello, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to kick off this uh, webinar session. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome all participants who've arrived and also our speakers for today. Uh, my name is uh, Eve Silver from Wetlands International European Association. Um, this is a webinar in a series of talks on uh, restoring river continuity. And actually it's our final session of this series. Um, I'm pleased to see uh, many of you have arrived today and I'm also pleased to see our speakers here. Um, please let me start with some practicalities. Um, this, um, this session is uh, recorded and we will uh, publish the video online afterwards. Um, it will be accessible through our website europe.wetlands.org. Um, so also find it later there. Um, this session will be a presentation by our two speakers uh, of more or less an hour, maybe a bit more. And afterwards, all participants will be able to um, ask questions. Um, please, if you have any questions, um, use the chat box uh, in the panel on your right at the end so that um, I will collect these questions and then um, I will read them out loud and give our speakers the opportunity to answer your, your questions. Um, first of all, let me introduce our speakers for today. Um, uh, we have uh, Professor Carlos Garcia de Lianis uh, here, who is the principal investigator and coordinator of the AMBER project. He is a professor of aquatic biosciences and director of the Center for Sustainable Aquatic Research at Swansea University. Um, his background is uh, in marine biology from the University of Victoria, and he has a PhD in zoology at the University of Aberdeen, uh, followed by a postdoctoral research at the University of Glasgow and Zetacel London. Um, uh, Professor Carlos he has over 30 years of experience in the fields of salmonid behavior, conservation and ecology. And he's been awarded in 2014 also a prize for his contribution to the conservation of Atlantic salmon in Spain, um, where he pioneered uh, in the early 90s about, on the removal of old unused barriers uh, to increase stream connectivity. Um, a lot of experience and I'm glad to have you here today, uh, Carlos. Um, our second speaker who will also uh, contribute to this presentation is uh, Jesus de la Fuente. Um, Jesus has a background in forest engineering at the Higher Polytechnic School of, uh, in Madrid. Um, for four years, he has been working on designing and building fish passes um, in Pontevedra in Spain, besides assessing environmental impacts of infrastructures in rivers. Um, after several positions as a civil servant, uh, Jesus um, working on forest management. Jesus started teaching in a vocational and professional training high school on the topics of topography, botany and forest management. Uh, welcome Jesus and um, uh, we'll now uh, move to the presentation. Uh, please Carlos, the floor is yours and um, start. Okay, so thank you very much Eve, and um, I'm very grateful for for um, giving us the opportunity to present this work today. Okay, so this is what we are going to do. This is the points that we would like to cover. First, we're going to ask ourselves, why do we need fish passes? Then we're going to explore the different fish passes which are available and we will see that one size does not fit all. Then uh, we will uh, look at some principles of design and construction that will be led by, by Jesus, by my colleague Jesus. And then finally, we'll look at um, what is required in order to assess whether the fish passes are working or not in terms of monitoring. And finally, I will wrap up with some lessons that I think have been learned over the last few decades. So first question first, why do we need fish passes? Well, it has been said, and I think for a reason, that everything that impacts on fish in freshwater and on ecosystems in freshwater starts with an age. The first age is over exploitation, is harvest. The second age has been habitat loss. The third age has been hatcheries and perhaps more specifically aquatic invasive species. And the fourth age, which is the subject of this talk, has been obstacles, barriers. In more often than not, 
caused by hydroelectric development. So this is the fourth H that we are going to be dealing with today. Now, why is river connectivity important? Well, I can think of many reasons. I'm sure you can think of other reasons as well. But perhaps the single most important reason is the following, is that healthy rivers are flowing rivers. Okay, so it's unnecessary, it's not sufficient, but it is a necessary condition for a healthy river is that it should flow. And this is not new, of course. This stems from the concept of the river continuum concept that was developed in the early 80s. And basically it says that you don't find abrupt or sudden discontinuities in a river ecosystem. So from headwaters to the mouth, you find a predictable and a gradual change in production and respiration, in stream order, in the depth, in the water quality, and also in the flux of nutrients. Okay, so that river continuum concept underpins what is regarded as the structural and functional integrity of rivers. So that's a very powerful reason, I think, why we need to maintain connectivity, but it's not the only one. The second reason, and this is more specifically uh, related to the topic of our talk today, has to do with fish, is that fish have a limited ability to change the environment they live in. And their main weapon, their main response to adversity is to move. Okay, so I think it's useful to regard movement, fish movement, as a reaction to adversity. And that underpins and determines individual fitness. It underpins the so-called portfolio effect, to what extent metapopulations can be leaked, and it also underpins the resilience of these fish populations that we are going to be dealing with in this talk. And in fact, assessing the effect of connectivity on freshwater systems has been one of the top priorities according to the European Platform for Biodiversity Research Strategy. And this is very much an ongoing uh, topic of discussion and of research. Perhaps a misconception is that only migratory fish need to move, and there is nothing farther from the truth. All fish species in freshwater move to some degree, and whether we call them migratory or not is just a matter of degree. And this is an idealized diagram of how fish actually need to undertake seasonal movements throughout their lives. So we start with the spawning grounds, and very few species spawn in the same places where they grow. They choose spawning grounds for a reason, and often it's because it's a place where there is isn't much competition from older yield classes. And it follows that where fish are born is not necessarily a good habitat for growth. From there, they disperse in what can be regarded as the nursery habitat, and then perhaps they may undertake feeding migrations to a feeding habitat as they grow in size and get older. They may go back to the spawning ground and repeat this cycle again, or they may, in some cases, spend the winter, or in some cases the summer, in a different part of the river. Those are seasonal movements. And from that overwintering habitat or overwintering ground, they may then go back to the spawning ground. So, yes, it is true that some freshwater species spend a lot of their time in very localized and limited in space uh, home areas, but it is also true that they need to disperse during a critical stage in their life cycle. So what happens if they don't? Well, I think that mounting evidence is accumulating in the last few years to suggest that even the species that are regarded as resident uh, can, uh, can suffer a lot if they are prevented from moving. So, it has been uh, determined that the importance for seasonal migrations and seasonal activity has been grossly underestimated and that even amongst resident populations or the resident component of a population there is a substantial degree of interspecific heterogeneity in movement and that this mobile component is critically important for maintaining the fitness and the resilience of populations. Okay, so it's very, very important to remember, as I said, that it is not just migratory fish that need to move in fresh water. More generally, I think we can classify the impacts of barriers or the loss of connectivity very broadly into two types, direct impacts, which more often than not will be the result of blocking, disrupting or delaying movements 
that is going to reduce the current capacity of the system. In extreme cases, it may lead to so-called Ali effects, that is where the reproductive success of populations diminishes uh, rapidly a very low population abundance. It will also can generate, as we are discovering in recent years, substantial artificial selection. Uh, this uh, blocking or disruption of movements doesn't affect all individuals the same. It affects some individuals more than others, and that imposes a certain degree of artificial selection. It can also, of course, increase mortality directly in hydro turbines, in screens. It can uh, compromise the fitness of populations by uh, exacerbating the effects of crowding or the effects of over-exploitation, particularly for migratory fish. And it can also increase the impact and the prevalence of infectious disease because it is a source of stress. Indirect impacts are also perhaps very important as well, and that, of course, will include the uh, impoundment and the loss of habitat, which occurs both upstream and downstream of large dams. Uh, dams are built for a reason, and the reason is because they draw water. So in most cases, you're going to find that a stretch of river is going to be devoid of the natural flow regime. And very often, these stretches are going to be sediment starved, which is going to lead or may lead to substantial extent of erosion. The water quality is going to be affected in the case of large dams. Temperature is a case in point, And also, the movement of nutrients is going to be disrupted. The hydrological cycle is also going to be affected in large cases, and we go from a situation where there are some natural uh, uh, changes in flow regime to one where low flows tend to be uh, higher than they would normally be, and peak flows tend to be lower. In extreme cases, which is a different situation, we may have problems with hydro peaking, which some people have equated these to so-called ecological traps. And it's an ecological trap because it forces or it encourages fish to undertake migrations thinking that there is a seasonal peak in flow at the times when it is uh, outside the spawning season and when that flow ceases you find situations like this where fish get stranded in parts of the stream which now don't have any more flow so what can we do well uh, it's a big big problem and it's a particularly insidious problem for European rivers, because uh, there is a very long tradition, perhaps the, uh, more than in North America or in the New World, of building barriers, of building dams. And this is what the project that we have, uh, we are engaging, is trying to address, which is called Adaptive Management of Barriers in European Rivers, which tries to apply adaptive management to the process of restoring connectivity. And of course, one solution there is going to be the building of fish passes. This project is a um, Horizon 2020 um, project. Uh, it involves uh, 20 partners uh, from 11 countries. And our motto here is let it flow. And uh, <clears throat> it includes um, academic institutions from uh, eight academic institutions, four large, in some cases, industrial partners, uh, which are uh, hydroelectric companies, uh, four NGOs, and also four government organizations. And I encourage you to visit our website when you have at the end of the talk if you if you have time okay so perhaps the first thing that um, amber is trying to address is we need uh, better decision and prioritization tools it's never going to be possible to build fish passes or to overcome the problems posed by barriers uh, um, entirely so there is a real need to try to understand which barriers are in most need of mitigation and which barriers are not and also, what options do we have? Is it just a fish pass that we can do, or are there any other options? So that's going to be determined. The impact of these barriers is going to be determined by their number, but also perhaps more important by their location and by so-called passability. How easy is for um, fauna, for fish and other aquatic fauna, to overcome this barrier? And of course, the mitigation options are going to be determined by the cost, very often by opportunities, Sometimes this is more important than cost, and also by the benefits, which is perhaps one of the big unknowns that is becoming quite challenging to estimate. And the options, and before we go into fish pass proper, I would like to stress this, is that the first option, which should be, can the barrier be removed? 
can the barrier be breached? And if that cannot be done, then is the time when we should be considering other options, including a fish pass. But let me summarize very quickly what are the advantages of not building a fish pass. And I think they should not be underestimated. So the advantages of breaching the barrier or removing it completely are several and very important. First of all, it solves both upstream and downstream passage, something that very few uh, passage facilities are able to do. Second, typically, not always, but typically, it's a cheaper option than building a fish pass. Third, it achieves an integral restoration of the ecosystem as a whole. It's not just um, you know, a, a, um, a patch, it's something that, that uh, basically overcomes the problem, it gets rid of the problem. Fourth, it addresses other problems which are important in the case of all barriers, all dams, like for example, structural safety. And finally, and this is very, very important, it does not hinder future options. Very often we have found situations where a fish pass has been built at great expense, has only been found, it was not working properly, but nothing is being done simply because so much money was spent on it. Okay, so this is very important to remember. If we spend the money, it's going to be very difficult if it doesn't work to do anything about it. And of course, there are also shortcomings. Breaching barriers or removing barriers uh, is not always possible. There are some shortcomings. And the shortcomings is that there is not always practical or feasible. There may be a short-term mobilization of sediments, Sometimes this can be toxic. There isn't as much experience in Europe as, for example, uh, there is in North America, and we have much more experience building fish passes than removing dams. There are issues related to culture and related to the uh, historical value of some of these barriers, some of these weirs or dams, which need to be taken into consideration. Sometimes they have a, a value of their own, so we cannot, they cannot be removed. And finally, the admin, the paperwork, and the bureaucracy that is involved sometimes can be quite daunting. So it may take a long time. But I think it's important that before we embark on building a fish pass, we remember that that should not be your first option. Okay, so let's assume we have decided we have opted for a fish pass. Which one are we going to use? Well, let me tell you from the start, one size does not fit all. And I'm sure you know this, but perhaps sometimes we forget why it is so. It is the case because barriers differ. There isn't a single type of barriers. All barriers, well, not all, but they are very different, as we'll see in a moment. Second, fish species differ. Remember, fish are the most abundant type of vertebrates. There is more fish species than all the other vertebrates put together. There's a huge degree of variation. So that means that no single fish pass is going to be best under all conditions. So <clears throat> this is the results, preliminary data collected by our colleagues in Italy, uh, based on the um, inventory of uh, barriers in European rivers. And one of the things that was shocking for us was to discover that there are 290 different types of barriers. Of course, sometimes it's the same barrier, which is being called with different names, but more often than not, they represent genuine differences in barrier morphology, in barrier typology. So it's a huge variety of different barriers that we need to take into account. They differ in size, they differ in location, they differ in the use, they differ in the area which is impounded upstream, they differ in the extent that they abstract more or less water, they differ in the materials that they were used to build them, they differ a lot in when they were built, and they differ also on the state of conservation. And all these things are going to impact fish differently. So I'm just going to flip through quickly. Um, of course, most of you are, will be familiar with the large dams, but uh, most, in most cases, these are used for hydroelectric generation. But increasingly, we're encountering smaller hydro developments, uh, weirs which are not, uh, which are not uh, as high as the typical dams that were built in the 50s and 60s, but much smaller in the headwaters of some of our streams. We also have old weirs that were used for water mills and irrigation and that papered most of our streams throughout Europe. And some of them are in a very, very sad uh, state of repair. They serve no useful purpose, but they are there and they are still causing some damage. Uh, increasingly, and this should not be forgotten, barriers are also 
uh, the result sometimes of flood defenses. There is no physical barrier here in terms of a structure, but this is going to create a, a velocity so high that it's going to be almost impossible for many fish at low flow to overcome these sort of stretches in the rivers. I'll just give you some extreme example of this. Sadly, this is happening in national parks in Europe. Uh, this, is, um, this is in Spain, in uh, Picos de Europa, where the flood defense um, approach of hard engineer has gone to these extremes where they have actually cemented even the bottom of the stream. Of course, it's impossible for fish, regardless of flow, to overcome this sort of structure. We also have increasingly culverts, which is seen by engineers as a cheap substitute for low bridges, and um, they are everywhere and their number is increasing exponentially. And the problem with this is that we have very limited information on where they are or how many there are, because they are not normally surveyed in barrier inventories. And finally, this is increasingly a problem, particularly for, south, for the southern part of Europe. There is no uh, worse barrier than no water. And this is happening increasingly more and more. This is a salmon river. This is in the Iberian Peninsula. This is one of the most famous salmon rivers of, uh, of Europe in terms of uh, the, how old these populations are. And for several months during the year, it has no water, simply because it doesn't rain as much as it used to, but also because there's much more people, many more people drawing water from these rivers than ever before. Okay, obviously that's a barrier. That's the greatest barrier. Okay. Thankfully, uh, the data that we have been collecting suggests that most barriers are actually quite small, okay? So it, is, it follows this decay curve where the probability of uh, the abundance of barriers is almost inversely proportional to its height. So we have uh, a lot, the vast majority of these barriers are between uh, less than two or three meters, okay? So <clears throat> in a way, that's good news because, of course, the approach to, uh, to improve fish passage in these barriers is going to be much easier than for large structures. Okay, so <clears throat> barriers are not the same as we have seen, but also fish are not the same. And uh, unfortunately, we know quite a lot about a few fish, about their swimming stamina, their swimming abilities, but as it happens, the fish about which we know the most happen to be the strongest swimmers. These are the so-called sport fish, particularly salmonids, and there is a long tradition of designing fish passes for salmonids. And as it happens, not only they are the strongest swimmers, they are also some of the fish that attain the largest size. So fish passes which are designed with salmonids in mind are unlikely to be any good to most of the fish. And just remind you that in Europe alone, we probably have in the order of 500 different species of fish, of which salmonids are just a handful. So, Information on swimming ability and swimming stamina for most other fish, uh, let alone uh, invertebrates, is uh, very, very patchy in the best of cases. And the information we have refers almost exclusively to upstream passage. There is very limited information on downstream passage of other species other than salmonids. This is uh, something that uh, needs to be tackled rather urgently because also it has a bearing on the spread of aquatic invasive species. We also need to know to what extent these structures that we are now starting to design will make the problem of aquatic invasive species worse. And information on the critical swimming speeds of some of these species is becoming rather urgent. Uh, fish, as I said, are the most extreme and heterogeneous type of vertebrates, and they differ a lot in life history traits, and they also differ a lot on swimming stamina. And just to, this is a, 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 a rough approach, if we just look at the variation in so-called aspect ratio of the caudal fin, which is defined as the ratio between the height raised to the, to the square divided by the surface area. And we can basically very roughly uh, classify the fish into two types. Those that have so-called lunate tails, which are designed for efficient high speed. They move less water by using these uh, lunate tails. And this is typical of cruisers. This is typical, this is a marine example, but it applies also to fresh water. This is typically uh, the situation for fish that can go faster for longer. On the other extreme, we have so-called rounded tails. 
these are species which have a low aspect ratio, they cannot swim for very long, but they, because they move more water. And this is uh, the sort of tail that you want to have if you're a barter, if you are required to swim in short bursts. Okay, you are not, be, you are not expected to swim uh, fast for long periods of time. Well, as it happens, and this is just um, a sample of fish, if we look uh, at what is the distribution of this aspect ratio in some of the European species we're dealing with, we find that, yes, um, some of them have a high aspect ratio, like salmonis and dace, and these are species which are going to have a good uh, swimming performance, but many of them are species which have a very low aspect ratios, and they're almost as abundant as the others. Okay, And as I said, information on the swimming ability of these species is very, very limited indeed. Okay, So we have concentrated our knowledge on these species, and we have forgotten, sadly, those ones. Of course, one of, to make matters worse, as I mentioned, one of the critical determinants of the critical velocity that the species, uh, fish species can achieve is how big they can, they can be. And of course, some of these so-called migratory species can be quite large, but some of the others that have even a low aspect ratio are going to be much smaller. So it's always important to remember that it is the fish that we do not see because they are small, the fish that are of no interest for the fishery because they don't provide uh, you know, a good uh, sport, the ones that also need to move and also be, need to be taken into consideration when we design fish passes. So swimming endurance, and this is a um, um, uh, comparison of the fish of the same size, so they are all fish of 15 centimeter, they was all these measurements were all taken at 10 degrees. And basically what we find here is the relationship between the water velocity that they subjected this species to and the endurance time. How long did it take before the fish got exhausted? And as you can see, first thing to notice is that swimming endurance is not a linear function of water velocity. At low water velocities, regardless of the species, they can go on and on, no problem but then it reaches a critical velocity where all of a sudden there is a drop, a sudden drop in performance and the fish basically just stops. And where they stop obviously differs depending on the species. So that will differ with fish size and also with water temperature. <clears throat> this is um, some relatively recent data uh, collected by um, researchers in, in Spain where they use open channels um, basically, in this case, they look at two species. Uh, this is, I think, an interesting piece of research where they have, uh, where they see that in this case is uh, uh, a barbell where uh, the distance they can travel before they stop is, they have modeled this as a function of water velocity in the channel. So as you can see, at one meters per second, the channel was only 40 meters long. So basically every single fish was able to, to travel that distance, uh, almost uh, more than 80%, 90% of the fish. If you go to 1.5, then you find that 50% of the fish will stop at about 13 meters and so on and so forth. When you get to 3.5 meters per second, what you find is that 50% of the fish were unable to travel farther than three meters. So the distance that fish can swim diminishes very rapidly in a non-linear fashion at high velocities. And this is one of the key criteria that needs to be taken into account, as we will see in a moment, when we design fish passes. So let's, learn, let's now turn our attention to the fish pass design proper, so-called fish pass Lego, if you will. So this is not new. Um, it's interesting to notice that the first um, mention of fish passes probably date more than 500 years ago. Uh, there is evidence that in 1500, the, in the Ming Dynasty in China, there was explicit um, a reference to the need for a fish passage. But perhaps the, fish pass, the first fish pass that was properly documented is credited uh, to France where they use, uh, in the 1650, they use bundles of branches to create the steps uh, in order to bypass um, a water mill. Uh, later, in 1678, and I'm very fond of this map, uh, you can see where legislation was passed by royal decree that uh, made it illegal uh, to block the uh, passage of migratory fish 
And in this beautiful map, you can see the so-called salmon estocades, which prevented fish passage, and the king had to intervene to make sure that the migratory fish, which sustain this important fishery, were able to go all the way upstream. So um, um, a rules and a decree was passed regulating uh, how these estocades should be built. Uh, in 1700, in the city of Falmouth, uh, there was a, a litigation against the owner of a dam and a fishway was required. In 1790, the state of Massachusetts passed legislation requiring fish passage. Uh, in 18, as you can see there, 37, a fishway uh, patent was filed by uh, Richard McFarland of New Brunswick in Canada to bypass a lumber mill. And it's only recently that perhaps uh, the more advanced uh, fish passes were actually designed. And I think it's important to remember that the buffalo system that we'll see in a moment was invented by uh, Mr. Daniel, who was a civil engineer in Belgium, and that, that was uh, developed in the 1910s and uh, with Atlantic Salmon in mind. That was later modified in 1983 by Larinier and colleagues, which uh, uh, they modified the buffalo the original Daniel fish pass uh, with uh, low floor baffles and clean walls, as we'll see in a moment. Okay, so these fish passes, um, the ideal fish pass should have uh, some uh, characteristics uh, uh, which are important to remember. The first one is that it should not hinder volitional movement. And by volitional, we mean that it should not impede the free movement of fish whenever they please. Second, it should work well for all species and under all flows. Third, it should work both upstream and downstream. And fourth, it should be cheap to build and easy to maintain. And I'm sure you have guessed it, that this pass doesn't exist. So, <clears throat> The six basic types of fish passes, there are many variations, but I think they can be conveniently classified into those which made use of pools and weirs, or vertical slot is a variation of those, those that are modifications of chutes or ramps with baffles or structures that will slow down the flow, fish lifts and locks that will simply take the fish from downstream of the dam, upstream of the dam, through a, a water uh, lift, nature-like um, or nature-type or nature-like fishways, which are becoming uh, much more uh, the subject of much more research in recent years, and finally a relatively recent development called the fish siphon, which we'll show you in a moment. Generally speaking, I think this fish, all these fish passes, can be classified according to four criteria. The first criteria is whether they are hard engineer or whether they are nature-like. The second criteria may be whether we're dealing with upstream or downstream fish passage, because sadly, different structures are required to tackle these very different problems. The third way of classifying the fish passes could be by looking at whether we are dealing with volitional movement or whether we are dealing with assisted passage. And finally, uh, we need to deal with either flow which is plunging or flow which is streaming. And it may be said, at the risk of being sarcastic, that fish passes can also be classified, has been said, between those that seldom work and those that work sometimes. Okay, so <clears throat> according to that definition, I have, we have produced this uh, little um, classification typology where the hard engineer fish passes, which are the ones we're going to be dealing with, which are the most common ones, are over here. This can be classified into upstream or downstream. The upstream ones can be classified between volitional movement or assisted movement, and the volitional ones can be further classified into shoots or pool type. The shoots would include those that have baffled structures or those that have substrate as EL fish passes, and these are just modifications of the original Denil um, design of the 1910. The pool type fish passes can be can include as the four uh, typical um, um, uh, fish passes, the pool and weir, the vertical slot, the ice harbor design, or serpentine approaches, and the assisted ones will include locks and lifts, Archimedes screw, a uh, trope and hole, although not a fish pass proper, but it's a very popular and in some cases efficient way of uh, moving fish around and fish siphons of various types. And finally, 
in terms of downstream fish passage, I think we will be dealing with guidance structures, exclusion devices, ways of bypassing the dam, and also the application of trap and hole approaches. In terms of nature-like um, approaches to fish passes, I think they can be conveniently divided into bypasses, which are represented by side channels and ramps of various types, which uh, can be um, further classified into roughened uh, uh, substrates or step pool approaches. So I'm just going to flick you, uh, flick through relatively quickly, just so that you have an image of what fish passes were dealing about before Jesus goes into the specific design criteria. This is a typical pool type, pool and weir fish pass, which is perhaps the most common and most numerous uh, uh, type of fish pass you're likely to encounter, yeah, at least in Europe. This is a modification. It's also a pool type, but instead of having a pool and weir, you have this structure which is a vertical slot, uh, which uh, produces, achieves um, a superior uh, flows in terms of a hydrodynamic uh, performance. This is a so-called ice harbor type of fish pass, which is uh, has design in America. And basically, instead of just having, it has uh, two orifices there, and passage is achieved at the two sides of the, of the vessel, at the two sides of the pool. In terms of shoots, this is the original Denil fish pass where you find that you have a buffle at the bottom and also on the sides, and this is inclined 45 degrees upstream. Here you have two such Denil fish passes for uh, in a relatively small river. This is uh, the modification that Larinier and colleagues developed based on the original design. That's the so-called superactive buffle which dispenses with the need for lateral buffles, so it concentrates all the buffles in the bottom. This is a modification called Alaska type. Sometimes you may see this being called as a chevron type. This is again some of these uh, chevron type or uh, superactive Latimer um, buffle system. And one of the advantages of these type of systems is that it can be made in modular sections it's relatively easy to install and um, it allows free passage not just of sediments but also of canoeist and, uh, and uh, another fauna. Perhaps a specialized type of a shoot is a fish passes that have been designed specifically with the need of eels or in some cases galaxies in the southern hemisphere which are fish that can spend some time outside the water and what they need is simply a wet surface where they can basically wiggle their way through and overcome uh, these barriers that would in other cases uh, be uh, a source of uh, loss of fitness. In terms of assisted fish ways, um, uh, fish, um, so-called fish lift, the Borland fish lift is perhaps one of the best known. Uh, this uh, again was a uh, 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 um, fish pass of choice in large dams, as it was the case here in the River Shannon in Ireland, because it was impractically impossible uh, to build other types of fish passes, and this was seen as a good compromise. Unfortunately, it's only relatively recently that people have discovered that most of these fish are actually not using the fish pass. Uh, one modification of the lock approach is basically to simply attract the fish towards a, a lock and then use that to load the lorry, to load the truck, and that truck is simply uh, takes the fish upstream and the fish are basically released upstream of the dam. And that is done in many cases in places where it has been shown that the original fish lift, it wasn't working. This is a relatively recent development. Uh, this is by some of our colleagues in Southampton who are studying this particular site, which is the use of an Archimedes screw, which basically uh, takes fish uh, uh, from the bottom and then just uh, uh, transport them upstream uh, gently, because this is a slow rotating Archimedes uh, over relatively small distances. And finally, there is an increasing um, uh, interest in so-called siphons of various types. Uh, one was recently installed in the UK by the Environment Agency, I believe, last year. 
uh, there is a company in Holland that manufactures this, and apparently they have met with a lot of interest, and they have been, they appear to be very successful in some cases. Um, one particular type of um, siphon, which I think is extremely, extremely interesting, and it's a pity I cannot show you the video because uh, it's too slow, the connection, but I have added the link to the video so you can look at, at your perusal after you finish, after we finish the talk, is the so-called air vacuum that has been developed and manufactured by Woosh uh, Technologies in America. Uh, that's basically a system that uses an air vacuum to basically propel uh, the fish over a hose, or they call it a glide, uh, over uh, great distances, as we'll see in a moment. So this is the hose or the glide. You can see a fish inside. This is full of water. And what they do is that they create a pressure differential uh, uh, in this machine that basically expels the fish at a considerable velocity over the dam. And as I said, you can see the video over there. Uh, there are a couple of videos, and this is a very, very interesting uh, new development. Basically, the way it works is an air blower uh, creates a differential pressure in one end to the other, and then positive pressure is created there. Um, basically, uh, that impels or expels the fish uh, in, this, uh, in this hose. Uh, this is the inside the hose. Uh, it has a pressure of about uh, 6,800 pascals. The manufacturer claims and has shown that there is no, no loss of slime or scales, and there doesn't appear to interfere or impair uh, reproductive performance of the salmonids they have tried. They manufacture different tube sizes that should cater, should accommodate fish from anywhere from 500 grams to over 15 kilos, and I'm told that they are in the process of manufacturing a new hose that will also cater for even a smaller fish than this. This is how it works, that's the entrance. Uh, so far, the species that this company has been able to move successfully uh, is quite impressive, include, you know, migratory salmonids, but also a much smaller and delicate species, like, for example, American shad, with success. Okay, this is, I don't know if you can see there, this is in Washington State. The hose in this case is 530 meters in length. The uh, height difference that they need to overcome is 50 meters high, and it takes roughly 60 seconds for the fish to be transported from the bottom, from the tail race, all the way upstream to the dam. Okay. And then by adjusting the angle and the pressure, I believe that they can cater for uh, various uh, height, dams of various heights. And uh, this is what you will see in the video. That's the fish coming into the hose. That's the hose being laid over the dam. And this is the exit point where the fish actually just uh, exits the hose and enters the water upstream of the dam. Okay, now let me turn our attention briefly to so-called nature-like fish ways. Uh, this is, as I said, is relatively recent. I mean, the concept is not new, but there has been a lot of interest, perhaps generated by the realization that traditional fish passes were not working as well as they should. So people have started to turn to natural solutions, so to speak. I think that nature-like fish ways can be uh, roughly divided into roughened ramps, step pools and side channels. I'm just going to show you some pictures. This is step pools and some roughen ramps where that height is basically broken down with the addition of boulders, which simply create dissipate energy and create conditions which encourage fish uh, to swim and also make it possible by uh, um, dissipating uh, or by uh, slowing down the flow uh, over the ramp. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> side channels is can be seen as another uh, way of um, overcoming barriers in a more natural way, which is basically rather than building a fish pass at the entrance or at the bottom of the of the dam or the weir, what you can do is build a side river. So you basically build a side channel, uh, which can also be used for spawning, can also be used for rearing nursery habitats, 
And basically what you do is that you break down that height difference through a series of meanders and you basically recreate a river and that uh, in theory could work both upstream and downstream as we'll see in a moment okay so basically you don't try to overcome the barrier of the barrier location you simply build a side river which as i said can also double as an additional uh, habitat for a spawning a nursery or both this is the appearance of one of these side channels it looks exactly like a river this is in france and this in particular one uh, was built to overcome a 5.5 high dam okay as you can see it's just uh, after some years it's just uh, additional habitat has been created and this is a very very simple uh, in terms of uh, engineering design approach to basically create a river that uh, that overcomes the barrier this is perhaps more elaborate but again as i explained before this is just a, a series of meanders which basically take the fish from the bottom and uh, overcome uh, enable the fish to overcome the barrier and they exit the, the the side channel at the point which i'm marking now okay and of, of course this area as i said can be used as a spawning channel and also as valuable nursery habitat again this is uh, the appearance of one uh, side channel after vegetation has grown and after the uh, system has settled down and uh, it looks uh, looks i think fantastic okay and now i'm going to pass the um, talk to my colleague jesus who is going to uh, take you through some of the more technical details of how this fish passes uh, should be built Sorry, I'm trying to. Okay, shall I? To share the presentation. No, no, it, it's not a problem I have here. Oh, I think uh, it's going. Now, uh, I think uh, you all can see the, the presentation. Uh, um, before I, I i would like to apologize because uh, uh, this is a challenge for my bad english my experience for uh, building a uh, fish passes uh, is uh, from some years ago and uh, also i have another uh, handicap with uh, with time because i i i should uh, be fast uh, 15 or 20 minutes, uh, I, 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 I suppose. Then uh, the general steps of fish pad design uh, are a topograph survey is basic to, to do a, a good design, a flow measurement, a, a how this flow a, affect a water level, head water level and tail water level, considering the, the, the barrier, the dam, what are the target species, what are the hydraulic consideration through the, the, the past, uh, how to choose the best option, uh, uh, how uh, to uh, face the building fast, phase because it's um, very difficult to, to build in a, in a river uh, because uh, water uh, will prevent uh, us to, to do uh, easy. And uh, at the end, uh, monitoring monitoring the the fish way to know if uh, it uh, really works. As Carlos said, uh, uh, fish passes uh, usually so uh, some problems, uh, and it uh, they does uh, they don't uh, work properly. Uh, when we have decided to to build a to build a, a fish pass. Uh, we we uh, we need to uh, determine a minimum size and cost of it. What uh, will pass the expected maximum run with the less possible delay? The engineer uh, will uh, try to spend. Uh, uh, as uh, less uh, money as possible 
um, in this uh, difficult uh, uh, will make it difficult uh, to to size uh, well the 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 fish way. Delays uh, can occur in two major areas in, in fish way entrance and during passage. Uh, it's uh, very important to decide the best location uh, to uh, avoid the lights uh, uh, looking uh, for the entrance. Uh, when we are sure that uh, we, we have made the best decision about uh, location, so then uh, we, we can uh, focus on, on, on passes. Um, Talking about this, uh, we need to match hydraulic condition with swimming capacity of target species. And we know, uh, as Carlos said, that there, there, there are a, a big uh, variety. Uh, we, we, we should consider speed and turbulences uh, uh, in relation with uh, swimming capacity. Also, we need to uh, calculate a pool volume uh, to accommodate ramp peaks uh, uh, to, uh, avoid, to avoid uh, turbulence uh, uh, through the through the through the pass. Um, as uh, I start, is uh, necessary uh, to make a, a, a good uh, topography survey. Uh, because if not, we don't uh, uh, get uh, a good design uh, for our fish pass. Uh, we uh, need to study uh, the flows and water levels because mm, they will affect uh, the, the proper way to, uh, to work uh, for our uh, fish pass. Uh, we uh, should know very well. Uh, what are the target species and what is uh, their uh, their behavior? To choose uh, the best location for the pass, we should also consider easy of access for both construction, uh, construction and maintenance. It's not uh, just uh, to consider uh, the best location for fish, uh, but we need to consider also uh, how to build and how to maintain the, the pass. Uh, how uh, this will depend on uh, flow requirements, resistance pools, uh, auxiliary attraction discharge, protecting the pass against river debris, monitoring needs uh, as uh, can, uh, could be gates, trapping device, etc. Um, when we um, talk about the building process, we need to know the legal permit uh, a license we will need, because uh, if we, otherwise we will have uh, we will get in trouble. It's necessary to design the different access uh, to get to the different uh, work areas. Um, uh, one of the most difficulties uh, is working uh, without water inside the river because we need to uh, manage the water inside the work areas. Um, uh, we need to pump uh, the, the, the water out and uh, we need to do it, or we, should, uh, to, uh, we should do it using uh, the canting and the canting or filtering pools uh, before uh, letting the water uh, go to the goes to the, to the river. Uh, we will have in the building process uh, uh, a lot of challenges uh, we need to be prepared. We need to uh, spend a lot of time if we are in charge of the building process uh, in the work areas to prevent uh, uh, any risks. Um, why do we need a topographic survey? Uh, we need it, uh, to know the characteristic of the river and the barrier in order to develop a plan. Uh, and we, uh, we have to consider that uh, maybe, maybe we need uh, more than one uh, fish pass. We need to determine the deep and uh, shallow uh, in, the, in the river uh, bed to know for example, for instance, the main current uh, at the different flows 
uh, because uh, it will be determinant uh, to know uh, what's the way the fees uh, go up, uh, the fees goes uh, upstream. And I will need to, to, to plan a route of access for heavy machinery into the building, the building uh, site. Uh, talking about where, uh, if the dam is uh, perpendicular to the flow, we can uh, choose uh, uh, both sides to, to build our fish pass. Uh, we can see at the image uh, a fish path of technical construction uh, uh, on, your, on your left uh, and on your right uh, close to natural construction fish, fish, uh, fish pass. When the, when the dam is not uh, perpendicular, the, the upper part of the of the dam is the place we we should uh, choose uh, to put our our fish way. If we have two two branches in the river, uh, one uh, where is the the powerhouse and another where I can uh, find at the image the where we need to to build a uh, two fish pass. Uh, otherwise, we will have a problem with the fish that uh, choose to go by the wrong uh, way. Uh, different uh, shapes of fish way, I can choose a curved fish way, liner fish way, or folded. If I choose because the, the distance to, to overcome the, the folder fish way, I need to design in a proper way the pool, uh, the resting pools. Because uh, as we can see uh, later, uh, Fisby, uh, uh, for example, for instance, uh, Daniel Fisby, uh, don't uh, we can't use a bend, bend, a bend, uh, say. The fish pass entrance must be uh, found quickly to avoid delays. As uh, we said before, we need uh, maybe maybe we need uh, for attraction flow because only a, a, a small part of flow of the, of the river flow will pass for our uh, fish way. Then it is possible uh, that we need for attraction flow to uh, avoid uh, to uh, increase the attraction of the fish pass for fish. Um, it's important uh, to consider that salmon is another uh, home and fish swim always upstream. Um, uh, continuing with our designing, we need information uh, on flows and water level, the point where fish attend to live and rest in areas. And this is a uh, time uh, spent observing. Uh, we, we, we should know if there are uh, any predators taking advantage uh, around the obstacle uh, because the lice will uh, help them to eat uh, our fish. Uh, and we need to place uh, the, to, to, to know where are the turbulent areas. Going uh, on the different uh, fish passes I will uh, talk about, uh, we have pull and wear. Carlos mm -hmm. have, uh, have already say, uh, talked about uh, them, vertical slot and then ill fish pass. We will take some notes about uh, the designing process. Uh, to help uh, or, to, or to assist us to choose the, the best uh, type for our um, river and our uh, case, specific case, we need to know that we can uh, use a table as you can see at your screens. Um, uh, taking into account species, slope, debris resilience, and health range. In, in gray, you can see when the, the, the type of uh, fish pass uh, can be chosen, and in red, when uh, uh, you uh, will miss this kind of, of fish pass. Um, we have uh, many tables, uh, many authors uh, wrote down about uh, considering uh, when uh, do we uh, use 
the different uh, type of uh, ways. Uh, in this table, uh, we have uh, some uh, advice to use pull pass and buffer pass. Depending on the spe uh, target species, uh, we will have uh, different uh, speeds and head drops. Uh, the head drop uh, that the fish uh, must manage to uh, to go to go up. Uh, about buffer pass uh, as Daniel uh, type, we we need to know the the mean uh, speed and the length of uh, every episode for for a uh, fish uh, going throughout our fish pass. Uh, uh, in our um, work, in our humble experience, uh, we produce this table uh, about a different species uh, and considering a small uh, the flow variation, the height of the barrier and the weak river. Uh, using the three uh, the three most uh, used uh, fish passes in Spain, pull and wear, uh, buffers, uh, shoot, uh, vertical slot and uh, I, I would like uh, due to focus in, uh, in the, the last species, aquatic animals. Uh, for uh, this uh, case, uh, the best option will be always open the barrier or make holes. We had some experience in, in, in this uh, type of uh, stream fish pass, and it's very interesting and uh, Carlos uh, talked a lot about uh, this uh, possibility. If we uh, talk about uh, pros and cons uh, about uh, pull and wear types, uh, we can say that uh, pros are uh, that they are uh, relative uh, low water requirements between 50 liters uh, per second to 500 Meet, uh, liters per second uh, for normal orifice dimension. Uh, they are well suited to live in fish such uh, as salmonids. Uh, they are relatively easy to build and uh, they are uh, tried and tested a lot of experience because they are the oldest uh, types of uh, fish pass. Uh, about cones, we can say that they are very sensitive to variation in headwater levels. They do they uh, they don't don't work well for not leaping species. They need regular maintenance. Required uh, clogging can greatly affect uh, performance. Uh, it needs more species than shoot uh, type five is wise uh, as then in type. Sorry, I can pass my my slide. No, what's, what's the problem? Mm, here we go. Um, about um, the dimension for bullpies, we can use uh, many tables uh, uh, using uh, species um, the type of uh, the pool passes uh, we will we will get uh, in uh, first uh, column, uh, we have the pool dimensions in case of a uh, pool and well. Uh, the second one is about submerged orifice, um, um, one pool and well in the third column with notches, and we uh, can uh, select uh, our length in the, in the range, the, the table, uh, provides uh, us. Mm, if we design uh, um, uh, a fish way for cyprinids and other weak swimmers, uh, we can consider this, this example. Uh, uh, this is an example of a fish pass of orifice. And the first pass in calculation, I, uh, I won't be able to describe all them but uh, uh, it's similar in the three types of paths uh, we, will, uh, we will study now. Um, the first also is the same, is uh, to uh, calculate the difference between headwater and 
uh, whatever. Uh, the second one we will uh, uh, will be to uh, check with the tables about uh, dimensions. The third, uh, we will study the, the jump. Uh, normally, normally, we will consider uh, 20 centimeters uh, to 15 centimeters. And uh, knowing the jump, I can use, uh, I can calculate a number of jumps and the number of pulls. As we know, the, the, the jump, uh, as we know uh, it, uh, each leap for this, we can calculate the flow speed using the equation you, you have in the point uh, uh, four uh, at your screens. Um, we can get the orifice dimensions uh, from the tables. Uh, um, we can go through all the uh, calculation process as you can see in the Azure screen. Sorry, but I can pass the, the slide. Don't know what's the, the problem. Uh, now, uh, to improve the vision of the uh, this kind of pool uh, passes, we can see the dimension of the orifs. Uh, we can realize that the button uh, is uh, provided with uh, boulders uh, that are fixed uh, to the concrete button uh, before it sets. Um, uh, the, the walls can be made uh, of hood or concrete. And uh, making the button uh, with uh, this guy, making the button with this kind of uh, boulders, we uh, reach uh, some advantages that we will uh, review uh, later. What are the pros of vertical slot uh, fish passes? They, they are uh, well suited to a range of species, including a small fish and weak simmer. Is I think vertical slot these passes are the the best uh, uh, to uh, to build in our uh, uh, barrier in general. They uh, they can accommodate varying habitat water levels. They uh, uh, result and affected by varying the water levels. They can cope with varying discharge from just over 100 liters per, sec uh, per second to several uh, cubic meters per second. And about cones, uh, they need more space to overcome the same height than two type fish ways. They generally are more expensive to build than other types. They need, but is this, the, this cone is a, a constant if you revise uh, the other uh, type of, of fish way. They need um, regular maintenance. Uh, they need regular maintenance. Uh, they, um, they they need an optimal design of a slot. Uh, if, because otherwise, uh, we will uh, get uh, and undesired uh, turbulence. About the minimum dimension, uh, we have to use uh, tables like this. About the experience of many authors. Uh, we have uh, the, all the dimensions we uh, have to take into account to design the the, the fish pass. Uh, is in uh, in vertical slot design when we use only one slot because there there are two types: uh, two uh, double vertical slot or a simple vertical slot, as uh, the case we have in our screens. It's very, very important to uh, to reach a, a mean current that uh, are diverted to the center of the of the pool. The, pool. Uh, the aim is to avoid a straight flow from one pool to the to the next. Is the reason why we have an angle uh, uh, from 20 degrees to uh, 45 degrees in uh, in the shape of the of the, of the lot. Um, hey, Sus, can, uh, you, can you speed up a little the presentation? I'm sorry, we're running out of time. Yes, uh, so uh, I, uh, how, how long, how much time I, I will have? Uh, five minutes or? 
Um, three minutes, okay? Three. Okay, okay. I will run. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, focusing on the importance of um, reach some roughness uh, at the bottom, um, we can see that uh, in the blue line, that our out bottom uh, provides uh, a better uh, distribution of uh, speed. Uh, um, uh, on that way, a slow ensures uniform vertical velocity profile, but the bottom substrate should ideally be the same as natural substrate and uh, uh, will facilitate a uh, same for benthic uh, uh, fauna and and uh, I was uh, as I was explaining reduce uh, flow uh, velocities. Uh, I can't uh, explain uh, in detail uh, the design, but uh, we need to calculate uh, speed, uh, the flow uh, discharge uh, depending on the uh, uh, coefficient discharge. Uh, we can uh, follow uh, some indication from charts. Um, and we can um, uh, finally to uh, get a, a slope. Um, we need always to consider the maxim maximum power density allowed, that is in function of the power of water and the volume of the of the of the pools. The, the, uh, going uh, through buffer fish passes, uh, in our case, uh, Daniel. The pros are that um, uh, steeper slopes are possible and low spaces record. Uh, they can be prefabricated. Um, uh, they are not. Uh, uh, they are uh, largely unaffected by various intel water level, and they have a good attraction flow. About cons. Um, they uh, result much affected by variation in head water. They are easily clogged by debris. They need regular maintenance record as the other types and high head difference compared to, to, to other uh, passes. I can't uh, stop um, in the design, but is uh, uh, we need to follow the same steps. And it's very important that the column of water uh, 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 is uh, at least uh, 35 centimeters over the vertex of the triangle of each uh, each buffer. Um, as we as we uh, we we don't have time only to finish. Uh, uh, explain that there are many charts to select uh, the the speed the 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 width of the channel because. The most important thing in the design is the the, the width of the of the channel and the other the other the other uh, dimension of the buffers will uh, will be uh, taken from from this uh, width. Uh, sorry for the delay. If it's okay, um, thank you. Um, I want to invite also participants to um, look at the presentation. We will be we'll make it downloadable from our website later, um, so people can also look at the details more later. And perhaps if they have any questions, um, they can always send an email. Um, okay. Perhaps Carlos, you can give us a final takeaway message because I want to allow a bit of time for the participants to. Uh, ask some questions before we have to finalize the session. So maybe you can um, yep. give us uh, one conclusion or one final takeaway message. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Please, uh, you can share it now. Okay. So <clears throat> I just want you to, to 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 insist in the message we said before is that it's only recently with the development of new technologies for monitoring fish, particularly telemetry that the problems have become apparent and these are recent news in the press you can say there what's the damn problem do not pass the failed promise of fish ladders etc etc uh, <clears throat> just basically to sum up uh, the evidence suggests that downstream fish passage efficiency is in the best of cases roughly about 70 70 60 70 percent Upstream efficiency uh, in different studies is on average about 42%, but that not surprisingly, salmonids were the most successful 
non-salmonids were not very successful and most traditional fish passes simply don't work and don't fully mitigate for stream fragmentation. So <clears throat> I think that uh, what is important, and this is, uh, I think, uh, an interesting way of looking at uh, why perhaps our approach to fish pass design has been wrong, is to understand that passage efficiency is not simply looking at how fish go through the fish pass itself, which is what uh, most studies have concentrated on, but also to take into account the probability that the fish will approach, the probability that the fish will enter the fish pass, and it is this combined probability which is made up of three steps, approach, entry and passage, which determines to what extent the fish pass is mitigating for the barrier or not. And I think this is an interesting way of actually um, looking at an old problem from a, from a different angle. Of course, <clears throat> the problem is that we don't have controls. It's very difficult to know what would be the control here? What could we use as the baseline to understand to what extent the barrier is impairing approach or impairing entry? And that's uh, an unresolved issue. So let me finish by saying that also in cases where the fish passes do work, interesting evidence suggests that those fish that pass are not a random sample of the fish that enter the fish pass, but as this study uh, very convincingly demonstrates, the fish that were caught at the upper part of the fish pass appear to be larger, heavier, had a higher density of muscle fibers, had a higher glucose level, uh, had a different uh, uh, concentration of red blood cells. And this imposes, uh, can impose a huge degree of artificial selection on even fish passes that work. Because as I said, and as these studies start to demonstrate, the fish that make use of them are not a random sample of the population. So let me finish by saying that uh, I think it has been said that there is more data has been collected in the last two years, the last three years, than in the history of mankind. And that has led us to believe that the knowledge has paralleled the acquisition of data in an exponential form. And this has been pointed out has led us to believe on the so-called techno-arrogance. And people have uh, realized that this is what we thought we knew, simply based on the amount of data we are producing, the number of studies that we are conducting. But in fact, what we do know is far from that. What we know, and this applies, of course, also to fish passes, doesn't follow that curve. It jumps in leaps and bounds, and uh, that gap is simply getting increasingly larger. And this frustration, with the failure of fish passes is perhaps a reflection of this a blind belief in, the, in this acquisition of data. So to readdress that, I will finish by saying that adaptive monitoring, that is learning what works and doesn't work, is key. Fish passes, as Jesus pointed out, must be routinely checked and kept in good order. Standard operating manuals are absolutely uh, essential. And that uh, we should view fish passes as a BBS, uh, best of a bad situation. These are simply stop gap solutions. Barriers remain, they don't go away by building a fish pass. And even if we have a perfect solution for fish passage, we are not addressing ecosystem connectivity. And the larger the barrier, the more true this, of course, is going to be. And um, we have um, some information, some links, which we encourage you to follow. And we are going to add also some references and some videos that we couldn't show which explain these things very, very well. Thank you so much. We'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you, Jesus, for this uh, very comprehensive information and presentation. Um, please also add your uh, email addresses to the slide, so when people download it, they can perhaps contact yeah. you um, with more questions, if they have. Okay. Um, I would like to ask the participants if they want to ask a question now, uh, live, please type your question in the chat function and we will um, be able to respond it uh, right away. Um, so thank you. And um, also considering your conclusions, uh, Carlos, I was wondering, um, we have more data and more knowledge now, which we can use to improve the design and the technologies of the FIS passes. But will a technological solution ever be sufficient? How, how optimistic are you about this? 
I'm not very optimistic because I don't think uh, more data necessarily equates with uh, more knowledge. To translate data into knowledge is uh, is a different thing. I think that what uh, our colleagues are starting to discover is that there is a huge degree of inter individual variation in the, in the swimming. And at the end of the day, swimming is a reflection of a behavioral trait. And uh, it's not just that one size doesn't fit all, it's that not all the fish are the same. So I'm not very really sure we will ever be able to produce, to build and design fish passes that cater for every type of, not just a different species, but every type of personality. And, um, and I think that is perhaps an unexpected challenge. Some fish are shy, some fish are bold, some fish are much more willing to move than others. Mm -hmm. And are we prepared to accept that fish passes may only work for that component of the population which is more willing to move than the others? And if that is the case, what evolutionary consequences that is going to have in our populations? Yes, and do we have already indications for the evolutionary consequences? Or is that too yes. soon to say? <laughs> well, yes, I mean, it has been pointed out, and this is not new, that by preventing the natural dispersion of uh, particularly migratory fish, we are somehow mongrelizing them. We are forcing fish that would normally spawn in the headwaters to mate with fish that spawn in other parts of the river. And that's not what they necessarily want to do. And we are losing these unique genetic variants that may only be present in some parts of the catchment. Yeah. I have a question from a participant. Um, if presented with the opportunity to spend money either on river enhancements, both upstream and downstream of a barrier, or for a fish pass, which would you do? Perhaps, Carlos, you can answer this question. Um, <clears throat> I would go for habitat improvement because the uh, the passage problem is something which perhaps can be tackled later on. Um, by making the habitat better upstream, perhaps there would be a stronger justification for coming up with more uh, permanent solutions to the barrier. What I am extremely concerned, and I think we have all, even in our lifetime, we have seen uh, solutions that were fine 20 years ago and then we discovered they didn't work. And those fish passes are still there. And people are very reluctant to do anything about them because it has cost a lot of money. And um, so definitely I would go for improving the habitat. Okay, that's a very clear answer. Also another question. Um, um, you showed that there's two different fish pass typologies, um, the engineered, hard engineered solutions and nature-like solutions. Um, given all the variety of the fish, uh, different fish species and the uh, hydraulic conditions, etc., cetera, um, is it uh, safe to say that there's not a better solution? One typology is not better than the other, so hard engineered or nature-like solution? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that nature-like solutions are very limited by the, the need for space and uh, they work very well for weak swimmers, for example. But uh, there will be cases confronted with huge hydroelectric dams where a nature-type solution is going to be almost impossible if you don't have the space or the will to build a, 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 a side channel around it. So, uh, yeah. I mean, yes, I would tend to agree with the with the um, with the with this person that uh, um, it's difficult to be able to say one approach, one typology is better than the other under all circumstances. Yeah. And Jesus, in your uh, experience of working in uh, in designing the fish passes, have you seen a lot of developments and or innovations happening? I know Carlos yes. showed us one. Perhaps you can say a few words about your experience and how fast these designs develop. Yes, because I, 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 I finished. Yes, yes, of course. I, I, I think in some, uh, some uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, the, 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 the hard engineering fish passes uh have uh, shown uh, an improvement 
overall um, trying to uh, use the bottom of the fish passes to help uh, benthic, benthic fauna and another uh, species different from fish uh, to to overcome uh, the the, the wells, the dams. I think it's a uh, and, and, and this kind of uh, fish passes are in connection with vertical slot that I think is uh, the fish pass uh, who uh, what uh, has shown the 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 greater or the greatest uh, improvement. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm checking if there's any more questions coming in. Um, okay let's see there's one more question um sediment regimes are highly impacted by barriers clearly barrier removal is key to improve but are fish pass designs starting to incorporate wider benefits to river functionality maybe is this something carlos can answer well um not that i know of uh and that's 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 always the, the issue that um you know, we we are dealing with fish. If we are lucky. We may be dealing with uh, taxa other than fish. But how do we deal with the transport of sediments and the transport of nutrients? And uh, pers you know, perhaps a side channel offers the best uh, possibility of tackling that problem. Mm. At the very least, it enables some some flux of material and some flux of uh, of uh, of nutrients, I suppose. But of course. Uh, Normal fish passes uh, cannot deal with that problem. I think. I don't know, Jesus, if you yes. have any views on that. Uh, yes, I, I think it's a very interesting question about uh, sediments because we are affecting one of the impacts. Uh, we trap all the sediments uh, um, up the the well, uh, up the dam, and it's a it's a problem uh, because down the the well the the bed of the river uh, changed uh, a, a lot because uh, the the it uh, have lost a, a, a lot of sediments um it will be interesting uh, to create uh, ways to transport uh, sediments uh, i mean uh, boulders and gravels from up uh, the dam to down the dam. I, I know some examples uh, here in, in Pontevedra, in Eiras, uh, where it's a, a big dam uh, built to provide water to a big city, uh, Sibigo. Um, they, they track uh, big sediments uh, from up uh, the dam to down. So perhaps there's some room for innovation here. Um, mm. An important uh, question indeed. Yes, I, but not using not using a uh, fish passes. It's not. I think it's not possible. Okay. I think this is a challenge for the innovators under. <laughs> uh, mm. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, I have another question from a from a participant. Um, he's asking um, if can we build one fish pass that could match hydraulic conditions with swimming capacities of more than 140 different target species for the Mekong. He's specifically asking about the Mekong mainstream. And if we cannot, then why does the government often build only one fish pass for their hydro dams projects? So. I think Jesus, you are. I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so because uh, 140 uh, species. Uh, I suppose they, they, as Carlos explained, uh, as Carlos has explained, uh, they will have different uh, stamina, different uh, swimming capacity, capacities. Uh, uh, maybe using a vertical slot, we can provide a, a, a good way to to uh, to cover all these different uh, uh, species. Uh, but I am not sure. And why do you think government only build one fish pass if it's not 
if it's not sufficient to allow different species to migrate? I don't know how they have chosen the, the species. If they um, uh, choose uh, the target species uh, because uh, it's the, the weaker uh, swimmer, maybe a, a, a good solution, but I, I think it's uh, insufficient. Perhaps I think, this is where the AMBER sorry, project uh, can help in the decision uh, support tool. Is that right, Carlos? Yes, that's right. And that decision support tool that we are developing is very important for two reasons. First of all, because hopefully we'll be able to estimate better than we have been able to do until now the impacts, the ecosystem services, which are lost through loss of connectivity. And likewise, and perhaps even more important, we should be able, we would like to be able to uh, estimate, calculate the benefits that this uh, um, uh, breakdown of fragmentation uh, can accrue. And that has been very challenging. That has, until now, this is not possible. We just don't know how to put uh, the loss of connectivity into monetary terms or to uh, the restoration of connectivity to try to see what benefits this uh, can bring about. Um, I think it's fair to say that fish passes represent a very good example of the so-called techno-arrogance. And the techno-arrogance paradigm shift basically says that uh, no matter what the scale of the environmental problem is, provided we can throw enough money and resources, everything is possible. And uh, increasingly we are seeing that's not true. That's not true. It doesn't work like that. I totally agree. Mm. I have uh, one more question coming in. Um, uh, going back to the sediment flow, what, which we were just talking about. Um, the question is, will the sediment flow issue affect the attraction of species to fish passes and cause effectiveness to diminish in the long term? That's a very, very interesting question. Um, I, I don't know whether Jesus may wish to say something about it, but I would add that uh, some of these fish migrate based on olfactory cues. Uh, we have a very incomplete knowledge of what exactly these fish are queuing on, but there is suggestion that they may be uh, properties of the water or the sediment or even conspecifics, pheromones, which may be harboring the sediment and um, a stream that doesn't allow the sediment to uh, move about may have uh, foreseen consequences on the hominability of some of these species. We just don't know. Uh, that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, do, do, you yes. have, do you have any information on that, Jesus? Yes, uh, uh, yes in, in addition to uh, the bio, bio, biological concept, I, I can point about uh, the changes in, uh, in the morphology of the river because uh, down the, 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 the way, the changes are uh, enormous. Uh, and uh, if we, we had a river with a gravel bed, uh, probably we will change the, the shape of the river totally uh, to uh, a boulder, a boulder uh, bed. And I think, I don't know, I don't know, but I think uh, fish uh, won't recognize the river because uh, the morphology is uh, quite different and also uh, the up, upstream movement can be uh, more difficult because uh, the absence of uh, this kind of sediments, gravels and uh, another uh, type of particles. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Um, one last question um, coming in, um, a very uh, detailed one. Have you any preference in like-for-like -like scenarios between buffalo passes uh, versus the Hassinger brush pass? I think this question to Jesus. Yes, but I, I, I couldn't understand the other type of uh, fish passes. Uh, buffalo uh, pass passes. At versus the Hassinger Brush Pass. Hassinger, I can understand this type of uh, fish pass. Okay, um, so perhaps we can um, uh, send, look at this question and then send the, uh, qu the answer to this at a late 
well at a later moment by email okay. uh, i've noted yes, it yes, yes, and yes, also the 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 person who've asked so um thank you we will come back to this question uh, at later by email okay we can uh, find a clear answer for you yes sorry sorry for that that's okay <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Um, this was the last question that we have received. Um, I want to thank our both speakers for the presentation once again. Thank you. And all the Welcome. participants who uh, joined us today and gave us such uh, interesting questions. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. This, is the, this was the last webinar in our uh, series on restoring river continuity. Um, we will upload the presentation and the video uh, on europe.wetlands.org. So please find, um, find the links for download there. Um, thank you, and um, we'll hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot.